Hi, welcome. My name is Adam Levine. I am Assistant Curator of European Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Thank you for joining us today. Today I am very lucky I get to speak to a brilliant artist, Kama La Macarel. Kama is a Montreal-based Mauritian Canadian multidisciplinary artist, educator, writer, and community arts facilitator, and literary translator who works within and across performance, photography, installations, textile, digital art, and literature. Kama's work is grounded in the exploration of justice, love, healing, decoloniality, hybridity, cosmopolitanism, and self and collective empowerment. I think today we're going to talk about a, you know, a gamut of, of topics and hear about some of Kama's recent projects and art um, in this moment. Um, but first, I want to start by acknowledging the land that the AGO operates on, um, which is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources of the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the federal government of Canada and the Mississauga of the Credit Anishinaabe Nations. Uh, and full disclosure, I'm coming to you from Lenape land. I am not in Toronto at this moment, um, but am grateful for the land on, uh, that I'm on right now. Hi, Kama. Hi, and I'm, I'm um, in Dejage, which is also known in colonial language as Montreal, which is the traditional keepers of the Ganyagehaga. Um, and this is the space where I live and where I love. And uh, yeah, so I want to take this moment to honor the lands, honor the waters that nurture us and honor the traditional keepers of those territories. If at any point you have questions that you want to direct to uh, me and Kama, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and, and we will bring them, we will incorporate your thoughts and your questions into the conversation. Uh, I think it'd be best, Kama, to open by um, situating ourselves in this current moment. Um, this moment is many things. Um, but in the most immediate sense to me, it's, it's, a, it's a situation of quarantine um, and of restricted movement. And, um, and so I wonder how has it been to uh, work from the, the confines of your home for these past several months? Uh, uh, well, I haven't, uh, I haven't really worked <laughs> over the past several months. Uh, I mean, no, I have been working over the past few weeks, I would say, but um, I mean, it's been, it's been a challenge, right? Like, it, it, it is an unprecedented times uh, in terms, I mean, partly the notion that we can't gather, right? Like, the fact that we can't actually be coming together. And I feel, you know, I've been thinking a lot of, of for me, of this entire period. I mean, it's been, it's been a period of grief, right? Like, in multiple ways, like, grief in terms of what's happening in the world, in terms of the loss of lives uh, around us, but also, you know, like, I felt like, for me, the pandemic, pretty the very beginning of it, like, the, those first few weeks were very much about grieving my own projects right which kind of which overnight all got cancelled uh and stuff like that so um i think yeah i think my approach so far in the beginning like for the i would say for the first three months was really to allow myself to be in the grief and sit in the grief and let myself live through it um because that was really my approach i was like just be in the moment and and then that for me grief is a process you know we all need i like to, we all need to we all have we all walk dark roads we all have those long nights in our life that we need to to walk through and and that's something that i fundamentally believe in is that if if, if we stay in them and we walk through them at the end of it there's always a light um, and right now, it's it's been a few weeks now where uh, where I think I like yeah I've been like stepping into the light so to speak. Uh, I just finished a, a two weeks residency with summer works in Toronto actually, but done virtually working from home, uh, which was my first time you know not going back in studio working with collaborators through different online means. Um, and I've we actually really been enjoying the process. I've actually really been uh, yeah. There's there's. Uh, it, it's different, of course, as a process. You don't have the, the 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 physical, the being, the sharing of space, right? Like being in the same space. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of nice at the moment to go back to the creative process, even if I'm working from home. 
um, but that also I'm also kind of enjoying not having to leave my home. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I, I asked you to come on the series selfishly because I was also grieving the same project. Um, you know, I was looking forward to coming to Montreal to see your play and then looking forward to you coming to Toronto for Trans mm -hmm. Gems. And so I wonder if you would be willing to tell us a little bit about um, those two projects which have been um, interrupted and fundamentally, I, I can only imagine, will change as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the, the two projects, so the first project is Zompan, which is my interdisciplinary uh, solo show. It, 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 it's basically a poetry score that I wrote, that, and then I was really intrigued with the question of uh, what would that poetry look like if it moved through my body across the stage? And that was really um, um, where the performance came from in terms of like the, the what I, what I was looking to explore in this performance. Uh, we, uh, we went, the performance was supposed to premiere in Montreal mid-April. Uh, we went into quarantine about a month before, just before the tech residency, um, which at the time really, like I didn't think, I mean, I, I can say that the show will be presented in the fall. I'll just say this much. I'm not allowed to say more than this at present, but um, sometime after October 24th, it's gonna be official. So I'll be able to talk about it. But for now, I'll just mention that, yeah, the show is back on. Um, so that's why I've been, that's what I was working um, on during my, my residency with Summer Works, for example, um, in that sense. And then the other project um, is the Transgem project, which I, which is a project I was running, co-running with Bilal Bag, who's a Toronto-based, wonderful playwright, artist, um, arts facilitator, and, uh, and it's with the Amy project, the artist mentoring you in Toronto. Um, and I have to say this, this was a, a heartbreaking one because the Trans Gems was a program, I mean, we had been working on it for many years in terms of getting the funding to make it happen. And it was, you know, it would have been the first of its kind. It was supposed to be a 10 day mentorship training program where we would have brought tra 10 uh, trans women of color, trans women and femmes of color, uh, indigenous and racial from, from across Canada into Toronto for 10 days. And Bilal and I would have co-facilitated a 10 day training, which would have ended with a performance at Pride, at Toronto Pride. Um, and, and I have to say, yeah, I have been thinking a lot of this project, yeah, about this project, you know, cause there's something about like the entire basis of the project even in terms of applying for funding was around the notion of isolation, right? Like how as trans people, specifically as trans women, um, and like, you know, how do we break away from, from, from isolation, right? Like, and the notion of isolation was so present in this project in why we were doing this project, why it was so special and sacred and magical and important for us that we come together in, in the same space uh, as a group of um, BIPOC uh, trans women and femmes. And, um, and having to cancel the project, right? Like having to, to actually cancel that project at the same time, uh, you know, at the same time that the rest of the world was talking about, I mean, the rest of the art world, there was a huge focus and there still is on digital art, right? Like there's been this huge focus on digital art. And I think with Transgems, we did ask ourselves that question at a particular point, uh, do, we, um, do we move the program online? But then the entire purpose of the program was to, break a break isolation right and then when we all went when the quarantine and the lockdown started right like we all started talking about the feeling of being isolated which i think for me was like another layer um over this like you know like just thinking of like this is a project that started from the question of isolation and trying to break away from isolation and then being back in that situation where well somehow somewhere we were all isolated every, every single one of us in different ways um, yeah, so we, we're reinvisioning the program right now. Um, I mean, we won't be able to do a national program. So right now we're in talks to maybe do a Quebec, Ontario um, kind of exchange and it won't be over 10 days, probably over a smaller. So we, we're talking about probably having a smaller version of this sometime this fall, but also all of this is dependent on what's going to happen. <laughs> As in, you know, what happens in the fall? Will there be a second wave? Will, will there be another lockdown? What will happen? We're making plans, but tentatively. Yes, this, this pattern that so many of us are in of um, 
modifying our expectations always with the caveat of buh, <laughs> question mark. Um, so your your play, um, which uh, I, 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 ho I hope that I can uh, see it in the fall. I was very excited to come to Montreal. You know, I've, I've, I realized that I've seen you perform in Montreal, in Toronto, and Berlin. Um, and, and in each of these performances, one, the word is really central. You know, you're um, uh, an incredibly literary performance artist. Um, but um, each of these performances really um, brought together many different strains of exploration that you use many media to explore. You know, um, when I, you have a, a, a long short bio um, because you explore a range of questions um, without regard maybe for medium, right? Because, you know, you ask the same questions in different ways through your work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so one of these manifestations is, is your book, um, which is uh, by the same name, Zomfam, um, and is coming out in September. So it's available for pre-order right now. Um, and I was very lucky to read an advanced copy. Um, and uh, I think, you know, reading this, your book, I went, I uh, girded myself. I prepared myself for what I knew would be um, um, a, an almost physical process of reading. Um, not only in the way that words are laid on the page in a physicality, but also that um, the words read like they are being um, uh, summoned forth in, you know, in the way that you do that's quite bodily. Um, and so to what extent is the book and the play, um, are, are they twin processes? Are they um, cousins? <laughs> <laughs> because you also you you're very engaged with lineage, so where, where do they fit on your family tree? <laughs> I mean, they're definitely related. They're definitely uh, queer queer siblings. Let's say queer family, chosen yes. family. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, um, the process. I both. Of, I mean, both those. That's the thing. It's like I. I have an interdisciplinary creative process, you know, like I work in visual arts, I work in, in performance and in installations and in poetry and all of this. And then I have a community based practice and then there's my life, you know, and for me, I, I, I often say this, I'm like, all of it is part of my life's work, right? Like for me, there's a, there's, it's not, I'm, it, it's, it's the same person and the same values that drive the work and it's the same questions that I'm asking and that I'm trying to answer through different media uh, in that sense. With Zumfam specifically, um, it, it, that's the thing. It's like, I didn't, those were initially separate. I they was those these were separate spoken word pieces that i had written actually i hadn't even realized that there was a project there i was writing in 2013 i wrote my wrote my very first spoken word piece and then totally fell in love with it and i've just been doing a lot of spoken words since then and a lot of it for me has been ways of like writing my family lineage because i love the flexibility like the openness of spoken word but for me as a self-taught artist i didn't have any form of formal training so um, yeah, there's, there's a way in which like, you know, a lot of my, of what I know is community taught or it's, um, you know, YouTube taught sort of a thing. And, uh, which I, now I, I see as a great advantage because I'm like, I get to, to use the form as I want. And with spoken word, that's what I liked about it. Like they, there was so much freedom. I like, I could tell a story in whichever way I wanted, which was even different from slam, right? Like, which is a very, um, has a formula to it. So I could move away from that formula. And I hadn't realized until 2016, actually after I, I did the tour in Europe and you were there for the show in Berlin. Uh, and when I had done this, I had basically put a body of my work together, a bunch of pieces, gave it a name and I was like, let's go on tour. You know, that was really the idea. And it's when after in 2016, when I came back from this tour in Europe that I felt like I, it was, it almost felt like for me that the body of the work was speaking back to me and telling me, hey, there's a story you're trying to tell here. 
come back to this, like pay attention to this story. So then that's when I like, I removed some, I, I, you know, I was really intrigued. I was like, what? Oh, there's, there's something deeper that I'm trying to say. So that's when I started putting those pieces together. I started rewriting them, creating new ones, developing the storyline around it. I mean, not just the storyline, but also the aesthetics, the poetics and all of this. And I thought about it just as a process uh, for a show. And even then I was thinking about it at the beginning as you know a process just for spoken word show which typically is me on a stage and um you know a mic stand and that's it like that's that's the spoken word artist and i love it i love that that form but the more i was performing the more i realized that my body wanted to move with the poetry and i really got interested in that question of what what would the poetry feel like in my body what would would it look like if i let the, the stories move in a space um and that's kind of like where the creative like the, the creative process in studio started um in that sense and i think when then i decided to turn it into a book um i was very you know, then I think that that part of the process then influenced the writing of the book because I was really, for me, I was really thinking of the body of the text, right? Like the body of the text as performing on, on the page, just like my body performs on a stage. So, which is why like a lot of, I mean, a lot of what I do with the book is like, I do actually do play with words, right? Like I, every single thing, every single thing in the book, like every single word, every single form of spacing, like everything then is super intentional. So in that sense then, um, and that's something that I have to say, I very much love about the book. I'm very much in love with it in that, in, in that way, because I, I think of my work as operating intertextually, because there are different levels of text, but also intertexturally in the sense of like, because there mm -hmm. are different layers of textures, right? Like playing into it. And it's been nice, you know, like, I mean, even that's why I love the, the cover so much, because the cover also was actually, literally, it was a fabric, it was a, a textile piece, and that was important for me. It was actually textures, textile piece that were actually threaded and collaged and painted, and then later on transposed into a photograph that then became the book cover. And I wanted the book cover to capture this, because uh, on the page now, when I look at the book, I, like, it's, it's visual, because it does all those interesting things as you hold it, but also it's performing but also it's literary and I love I love that being able to bring an essence actually you know like that 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 because really what I'm trying to articulate is a what I call a poetic and aesthetics if you want right like a decolonial aesthetics um, and 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 I, yeah and I'm also very interested in 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 the middle spaces right like what are the spaces where different media merge, but also what are the interspaces that exist outside of categorization. And for me, that's, that's meaningful because so much of my work is about um, ancestral loss. So much of my work is about ancestral healing. And, and for me, it's in those interspaces, right? Like it's, those in, it's in, in the between spaces that we can actually go meet the ghost, right? Like because the ghosts are neither dead or alive, they're in the middle spaces, right? Like they're in between. And so that for me, then those interspaces allow me um, to access for myself, but also to offer different points of access to whomever engages with the work, right? Like, um, of yeah, so, and uh, yeah, uh, multiple ways, multiple uh, levels for which we can engage with the work and the stories. It occurs to me, you know, um, your, your book uses many, uh, sorry, use not many languages. It uses Creole and English. I think you use French occasionally. Um, mm -hmm. It, and um, a book that was very formative in, in my, uh, learning was Gloria Ansaldua's Borderlands La Frontera. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a book where she uses um, uh, Spanglish and, and it really, you know, she uses the borderlands. She's not only thinking about geographical borderlands, but also borderlands between disciplines and borderlands between media. And she also cites them as sort of a generative space for that finding um, possibility um, in the bound, as you say, but in the boundary between, say, poetry and performance art, or even performance art and dance, when you think about sort of giving the body these words to perform, it's it's quite dancerly, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, regarding the language um, of Zomfam, it's it's beautiful. Uh, it's it's Thank wonderful. You. you know, you you you. Um, 
notably, you know, it, it's, you, there is an unfriendliness to the, you know, in some ways in the fact that um, you use Creole and do not provide translation. Um, and and it's, it, it's very clear, you know, um, that um, you're writing for many, many people. Um, and there are also access, the levels of access that everyone will have a different level of access, right? This is a Mauritian book. This is a queer book. This is a trans book. Um, this is a, a book by a colonial subject who, is, who has, has moved and lived on many lands. Um, so can you tell me a bit about your process of thinking about uh, for whom the, you wrote the book and, and, and how to choose the language for that writing? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it was interesting, like, I mean, the title of the book is Zum Fam, right, like, which is not, and this is a book that was written on, on those lands, right, like, which was written in Canada, which is being published in Canada, which is primarily written in English, except the title is not in English, right, and, and that was a question that I had to ask myself, right, like, I, I really, um, it's something that I went back and forth around, like, how am I even going to call this piece as a show? How am I going to call it um, as a book? And I think that part was really important for me because, um, I mean, this book does many things. Like, there are many things going on. Like, there are different levels of meaning. And, you know, there's, like, different stories going on, but also there's, like, different poetics and discourse that I'm trying to articulate. Um, and one of them really um, is, for me, around... Um, the reclamation, right, like of decolonial ways of being, like because it, it's very much about like ancestral, uh, the ancestral question, the ancestral healing, but specifically writing um, the, the 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 trans feminine gender queer uh, body within that lineage, right? Because I feel like, really in terms of like the studies of the indenture, there's there's an emerging body of work now, which is great, but like. Um, not so much about like you know we have like I haven't quite seen yet that trans lineage within that body of work and I think yeah like choosing zum fam as a, so for the people who don't know zum fam means it means men woman but as one term in Mauritian Creole but it can you know it could mean gay man it could mean effeminate gay man it could mean cross dresser it could mean trans feminine it could mean trans women it could mean but it means all those things. Uh, and, and I think for me, there was that question of, in terms of language, um, you know, like, I mean, the, the last piece in the book that actually talks about the story of Zumpam, which is a, a, a term that my mother gives me. And I think about this a lot, having my entire family um, back in Mauritius and the ways in which we communicate, you know, like the fact that I went to, I came to Canada, I went to a Canadian university, I have a Canadian university degree, and then, um, you know, and I came into my queer identity in many ways, like through the English language. But then mm. once I'm back home, there was that part that just didn't translate. But at the same time, when I'm back home in Mauritius, that's when I feel the most seen and visible and understood, even if we don't have the words for it. So I really wanted to unpack and repack and like, you know, really explore that entire notion of language. I mean, the, the book is about languages in the sense of like, you know, I talk about like the languages of love. I talk about the lineages of intimacies that we, you know, uh, that we weave in, uh, the, uh, the lineages of silence that we weave in between our intimacies. There's this entire part about the father's silence where, you know, like, um, so, a lot of it was in that sense, like yeah, the the, the question of language has been at the at the center of it um, in that sense. I, and I think in terms of bringing in, you know, like there's there's something about the my own cosmopolitan trajectory, uh, for lack of a better expression, in the sense of you know the I exist within the interspaces, right? Like I between like my my family, my dad's family came as slaves to Mauritius from East Africa. My mom's family came as indentured labor from South Asia. Um, you, uh, you know, I, and so I, I lived in a house between two religions, different ethnicities, different languages, right? Like Creole, English, French, even within the Mauritian context. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to honor all of this, you know, I wanted, and it goes back to the interspaces, to the hybridity, but I really wanted to make a space to honor all of this, right? Like I didn't want to write this for a Canadian, like I wanted all the complexities uh, and all the nuances somehow to be captured uh, within like all sorts of frames, like all sorts of references, which sometimes 
uh, are pretty slippery as well, even within a Mauritian context, right? But, but, but that's the cosmopolitan feeling of Mauritius as, as being, a, you know, Mauritians being a population of displaced people who were all forcibly taken to the island. And, and that's the, the, um, the cosmopolitan feeling of it, the hybrid feeling of it, which for me also on a more political level, like I also envision as, I, 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 as the future, right? Like for me, it's a way of imagining, you know, but me in, within the context in which we're living with the rise of the right, right? Like, and, and the multiple ways in which we're still being meant to be siloed and boxed. And, and I believe in a celebration of, of hybridity and, and I wanted to, yeah, the, so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do with all of this. And the one thing I would add, I'm just like, even the title says Zoom Farm, there's Zoom and Farm, but the part that I'm the most interested in is just like, this yeah right like it's yes. it's the middle space right like so um, yeah one of the um i think one of one of the projects that is most exciting to follow in the book is is your mining of lineages and mm -hmm. uh some of those lineages are forged by blood some of those are um, chosen families and, uh, and they're really built on, on queerness. Um, and so I wonder if you could tell us a bit about um, your multiple lineages and how they, um, and how you maybe draw strength and creativity from them in your art making process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um... <clears throat> You know, I, I haven't even known my grandparents. Like I, I didn't even know my grandparents. And for the longest time, up until my twenties, and you know, and of course there's a lot of taboo and silences in my family as well, as typically is where, you know, wherever there's trauma, there's silence and all of this. So I, I had very little sense of history and I never even thought about it. Like for me, I just took for granted that I had never known my grandparents. And it's not until my twenties that I started then, um, tapping into that question of lineages. Uh, first by asking my family about just my grandparents, who were they? And of course, nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, you know, but just like, first of all, in terms of knowing who, who, whom did we come from? Um, and that came about, like I did, like I went back to Mauritius at three times and I did like a, a whole family history project, like oral history project. We went back to the plantations where my dad grew up, for example, with my dad and two of his siblings. And they, you know, we went in the encampment and they showed me like the different, the, the house where they live and you know which now is all abandoned but like yeah so we went back to like just like getting to know more of that plantation history and what that was like I think at the same time that I was doing this you know at the same time that this book was coming together even if I didn't know at the time it was even a book uh, but the, one of the questions I was also tr I was also coming into my own queer and trans identities so, and and I was also asking myself that question of who are the queer ancestors um, and what is the queer lineage, right? Like, what is the queer lineage that 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 I come from? Um, and part of it, so so there was all of those things happening. And then I think I was also on my own, just like spiritual quest um, as well within within that framework. And as, as I was writing all of this, uh, and and I wanted to honor. That's the thing. And I also wanted to then honor all like those because I don't believe, like yeah, I don't believe that it's. I I, I do believe we exist. Um, through multiple lineages, right? Like for me, even the fact that I'm a published writer right now is because I come from a lineage of marginalized artists, right? Like who actually had to fight uh, to make space for themselves, right? Like, so they could be published, which makes it such that in my generation, somebody like me can have a voice and can have a space um, as a writer. And that's something that I absolutely wanted to honor, like the, the multiple lineages. Uh, the ocean, I have to talk about the ocean at this point because the uh, a lot of the, of the work then for me, because I was thinking a lot of the question of the ocean and the loss that happened through the journey. Uh, across the oceans and a lot of times you know we're like we, we talk about the ocean as the space of loss but for me at a point of time it really also became the place of healing because I was like okay if the loss happened through the crossings of the ocean how do I then go back to the ocean and retrieve right like retrieve uh, the stories um, and retrieve, retrieve the voices and and make a space make that space like yeah make a space for them um, 
so I would say that was an important part. And then, um, and you know, I, I work a lot, I work a lot with a lot of with youth. Um, and, and we talk a lot of times, like queer trans youth of color, mostly, and we, a lot of times that question of ancestry comes back. And, and one of my core values, you know, that's something that I fundamentally, fundamentally believe in, is the power of the imagination. And I think when there's that loss, right, like there's, there's always, there's, there's the, the seed that lives in us, that's part of our DNA, right? Like, and then for me, the imagination is the way in which we then can reactivate this. I don't believe we can ever access the past fully because uh, that's lost, but that doesn't mean that we still don't get to write an archive of the past, but also write ourselves into an archive for the future and the future generation. So I think there's also that part of like tapping into the imagination, um, you know, and, and, and creating the lineages, um, you know, in my case with my art practice, right? Like that's, that's why I love the art practice, but yeah, it, it allows us to then um, reclaim the past, but also offer a lineage for the future generations, right? Like it gets to, and that part is also important. So the ocean is uh, looms large in your work as this omnipresent force. And uh, yesterday I went to the ocean um, in preparation for this conversation. I thought I, I cannot talk to Kama without having recently dipped at least part of myself in the ocean. And after having read your book um, and it being fresh in my mind, I was watching people swimming and playing in the ocean. And I thought to myself, like, you must be so foolish if you can, like, I was aghast. I thought to myself, the ocean is the, the most fraught and violent space there is. Um, so playing in it is, is, like, is like cheating death. Um, and I, I, so I, I don't know if, I mean, but that's, you know, I think, I think that's sort of a, a factor of, of island life. And it occurs to me, you've also lived so much of your life on islands. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think the ocean is sort of, um, one of the ways the ocean appears is aligned with the term Kalapani. Um, and I wonder, like, it's, that's really, um, you know, it, it, you, it, it, it sits at this sort of ambivalence, right, that you have about the ocean in your writing, that it's um, a fiercely generative and generatively fierce place or space, or it's an absence, it's a void, and it's, and it's also a full thing. Um, can you tell us a bit about what Kalapani is and, uh, and, and how it lives in your work? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the Kalapani uh, literally means the black water. That's what it means. It means the black waters. And the Kalapani, so in, in um, like in, in Hinduism in particular, but really for populations of like of the Indian subcontinent, including indentured workers who, you know, were, were transported across the oceans, the crossing of the black water means moving away from the Ganges, which is the sacred river, which means that if you cross the ocean, you actually lose your humanity, right? Like you, you lose everything that makes you sacred because you're crossing, um, yeah, the black water. And um, and I've been yeah I've been thinking a lot of that of that question in that sense like in in, in this work but generally speaking in my work like in, in the body of my work uh, you know what it meant what it meant for the ancestors because they didn't know where they were going right like they they didn't know where they were going and they, but they knew they were acutely aware that they were crossing the black water and that that was that they were losing the the sense of of humanness the sense of humanity you know you lose caste you lose religion you you lose all of it um, within that crossing but at the same time uh, the other part of it is when once you get to the land right like once you get to the shore to the island in this case uh, it also allows you to there's also space to reinvent yourself and to recreate yourself right like this and and I think it's mm. it's because if if you have lost your caste that means by the time you've crossed the ocean and you get to to the land you do not, I mean, in theory, at least, you do not, you know, you're, you're not tied to your caste anymore. You're not necessarily tied to the same identity uh, in that sense. And, um, 
Yeah, so I was very, I was very interested in that question, but at the same time that for me, I explore the Kala Pani, um, you know, I'm also interested, one, one of the things that I definitely do with this work um, is, you know, reflecting for the question of like, yeah, what, what did we lose in that journey, right? Like we lost languages, we lost cultures, we lost so many things, but also we lost the gendered ways of being, right? Like, and, and I do have those two, two lines in, in, in the piece where I say, I, I, tra I travel across oceans, I travel travel across genders. So there's also for me that, that figure of, of when in exploring uh, the trope of the Kala Pani, of like reclaiming it, uh, I don't want to say queering it, but like reclaiming it to, to, to also bring, bring back, you know, like reclaiming it to bring back that, that, that possibility of, of reinvention, of transformation, uh, just as much as there's loss, but there's also a space for for transformation um, within it, for, for reinvention, for reimagination. And I wanted, um, yeah, that's something that I also wanted to explore within, within the narrative. I mean, I, I kind of, I've always wondered in thinking about this, like it, there's also a degree of fearlessness, right? The, the prohibition of the, the Kalapani is in some ways about building fear, right? You should not cross the ocean. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and if you have done that, and if you survive that, and you realize that you know that 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 this this thing is it that you can survive this. Um, mm -hmm. The perspective from the other side is is luminously different, right? Um, uh, it's like about the you know in some ways it's like disassembling a taboo. Yeah, I love that you said luminously different. <laughs> um, as in, because you know, as 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 at the very beginning when I was talking about the you know the, the beginning of the pandemic as as the dark, like you know how for me it was a time of grieving, and and I I I, I go back to that image a lot in my in my own life. Uh, you know, like the notion of the dark road or the dark night that you you need to walk through. Uh, and then by the end of it, right, like by the end of it, if you, you know, if you keep the faith, there's always a light, right, luminously. <laughs> and, and, and in many ways, yeah, the, the, the figure of the Kala Pani then for me, that, that idea of, of crossing, of that dangerous crossing, like I don't want to romanticize it, you know, I don't want to, romant uh, to romanticize it, but I do, uh, there is something, yeah, about like, you know, because it's, it's crossing the darkness, but also what happens, right? Like what happens once you've crossed that darkness? And I think, yeah, there's something, um, there's space for magic there, maybe a way of putting it that way. So we have a question uh, from uh -huh. our audience and, um, and our audience member asks, uh, just in the context of, of life on Canada, Turtle Island, being Mauritian connects with multiple histories of colonizing nations, France and England, and the diaspora of sugar and the islands um, that produced it. How do you navigate the complexity of decolonizing um, in your work? Um, mm -hmm. Ooh. I mean, oh, where do I even go with this question? I, you know, there's the part of like situating myself, like I think there's right. the part of, um, you know, I'm acutely aware of like where I'm situated and how, you know, where, yeah, um, and how I'm doing my work within this. I think a lot to, to, to even go even like to, 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 to narrow it down. I also live in Montreal. I'm in Quebec, which means that I also live in a very specific context uh, with its political situation, its social situation, and its language politics as a francophone coming from la francophonie, um, right? Like, which is not necessarily even like, you know, like even if I'm okay. francophone and I come from la francophonie to be able to get my Quebec selection certificate, which is what you need to be selected by the, go the government of Quebec before you can even apply for your permanent residency. I was required to do a French test exam right, like a, a, a French language text, right, like within, yes. within the francophonie, um, which I found like, I'm like, oh, but if I, if I was from France, I wouldn't have to, right, like, so there's, even within that language politics, right, there's that sense of like, oh, but if you're from France, you're like, you speak real French, but then if you're from the francophonie, the rest of the world that was colonized by France, right, where you're still francophone, like, it's not necessarily recognized. So a lot of, I feel like where my work is pushing in terms of, for me, articulating, um, a decolonial poetics or articulating a hybridity, right? Like an, a, a, a form of cosmopolitanism that is a return to the past. And yes, is an, a deep interrogation of 
um, you know, like Western frameworks in terms of like ideas of rationality, you know, because for me, like to take this as an example, the book, I, I love that so far. I've been getting this response from people who read the book where they're like, it's a deeply spiritual book. And I'm like, yes, this is about the spirit, right? Like this is what it's about. This is not about a linear narrative with a beginning and a middle and an end, right? Like, and, 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 the, and, and I think of like, like decolo a decolonial practice in that sense as interrogating those multiple structures, right? Like the reason the book is called Zempam and the reason why it honors like those multiple ways of being, like those different ways of being trans is because it is not the story of somebody who um, feels trapped in the wrong gender and then starts HRT and then, and I'm not saying there's enough, uh, anything wrong with this, but I'm saying, you know, mm -hmm. and then has the state has the state and the medical institution intervening into what gender is to them, which is the Western narrative, right? Like of, of transness uh, in that sense. Um, yes. And, and, you know, and I, you know, and the gender binary itself was a colonial tool, right? Like, and, 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 and that the, the dominant discourse is around, uh, you know, like, the transgender narrative is colonial, right? Like, so even that yes. for me, like celebrating Zompam was the whole point of it, of like even interrogating, right? Like the gendered with like being gendered, being gendered as spiritual, as a decolonial force and a spiritual force that's connected to ancestry and that's connected to community because it's about w your role within the community and it's not about the body, right? Like it's not about the medical intervention. Or, I say this again, there's nothing wrong. Yes. I'm not like, you know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with me seeking medical intervention in any way, but the fact that it's the colonial state that controls it, right? Like, so that's another way in which like, so for me, like all of it, like, you know, like uh, in many ways, the cosmopolitan part of it is the part where I'm just like, you know, cause there's so many insecurities in Quebec around and like, you know, both Anglophone Canada, but also all those foreigners who are coming into Quebec, right? Like, and yes. and for me, like, yeah, that, that's, and, and I think of Mauritius a lot like this, cause then it's, it's, it's that interplay of languages, of linguistics, of ways of being, um, that can coexist but that that doesn't mean that your identity will disappear the power dynamics might shift <laughs> but you know but like but, but we never talk about this really it's about like the french language is going to disappear the identity will disappear and i'm like it's not about that it's about making space for all of those so so uh, yeah i'm mean, just like everything about it really yes. i think it's about then unpacking it you know i give i give language as an example right now and gender as an example but that i was hyper aware of it i mean because also it was my own exploration of trying to answer those questions for myself that was ha happening at the same time that the writing of the book was happening um yeah and i think there's a lot to unpack there like you know if you want to go into the detail of it there's just like even for me when i reread the book i was like there were just like so many tiny details where you know it might just be like one line of a poem but it's super intentional in terms of the, the decolonial work that it does yeah, but yeah well, even, I mean, even your resistance, the, the way that you occupy borderlands between disciplines is, yes. I think, fundamentally anti-colonial, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, sort of uh, the fact that you are drawn to these spaces where lines are being drawn and where certain things are put in one spot and other things are put in another spot and, and just fundamentally, like, this is, I, I think, a, a decolonial or an anti-colonial thinking. Um, mm -hmm even if it if it doesn't relate explicitly to the thematics that we're talking about it it's a way of just um being sort of geographically irreverent to borders and discipline yeah yeah absolutely and i think like you know also i think that's the other thing to for me like you know when i think uh, i do look at my work as like a, a decolonial process right like in in so many mm -hmm. ways but i'm like it's not necessarily also I'm like, I let the work do the work, you know, I'm just yes. like, it's, you know, I'm like, I don't need to, I don't necessarily even talk about, I don't theorize it. It's mm -hmm. within the performance of the work. Like, and, and that's what I'm interested in as well, you know, in terms of my, my own practice. Like, there's just that part of like, let, uh, you know, like, let, let the decoloniality express itself within the work. I don't necessarily need to theorize it. Of course. So, Unless I um, want to. So to to return to the Kalapani, you know, and thinking about black water, I'm thinking a lot about the oil spill in Mauritius and how mm -hmm. Kalapani becomes an all too cogent and powerful metaphor in this moment. Um, what, 
how are you feeling? Uh, how does, you know, can you tell us a bit about what's going on and, um, and how it, how it is, how it exists in your life? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm so glad we get to talk about this. Um, I mean, for the, you know, for if in case for the people who are listening who don't know, so there was a, there was a, um, a vessel that wrecked on the reefs of, on the southeast of Mauritius uh, end of July. Um, and then it started spilling oil like two weeks later. And there was like, <laughs> Oh God, it's, it's kind of intense because that's the thing, it wrecked on the reefs, we don't know quite, it wasn't even supposed to be there, it wasn't naturally, it's in line where it was supposed in its route, but it wrecked there and then the government was inactive with regards to it and then there was like this entire oil spill that started that's actually in a protected zone that too in the lagoon you know and and there's been like a lot since then like even the government has been really slow to respond but there's been a lot of like grassroots um you know a lot of people have been responding to it in terms of trying to contain the oil spill uh in that sense like that that's really um it's the mv wakashio uh please look it up online like just look up hashtag mauritius oil spill on 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 twitter and like you know like i think there's because there's it's not necessarily you know mauritius being like this tiny nation island in the indian ocean like typically that's not we don't really pay attention attention to islands and I think there's and for me this this entire situation and I mean of course there are two ways in which I see it the first way which is like just very personal um because I've been thinking a lot particularly with now with this work with some farm coming out I've been like really thinking about what what it means I mean you know it's like oh I'm I have a book coming out about Mauritius but also there's this oil spill happening in Mauritius right now where I, you know, and for me, really the way I've been feeling about it was like, oh my, like I was like, oh my God, the island is sinking. Like that's, that's my feeling, right? And so much of my work, right? Like so much of the work has been into writing the island body, like that, that's so much of, and that's how I explore gender and body. Like there's always that play between ocean, island and body throughout the entire book and throughout the entire show. Um, and everything is explored through that, through that triangulation of island body um, and ocean. And yeah, so uh, just in terms of a personal level, it's just been really, really hard. Because, you know, a lot of, of, I've been thinking through like my own journey of having had to leave Mauritius to be able to actualize myself, to be able to become an artist, because that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't left. And that's one of the major reasons why I left, but also to step into my own queerness and, and find a voice for myself. But this entire voice then has been about then re reclaiming Mauritius, right? My, the majority of my body of work so, much, so far has been about re rewriting, reintegrating, my, uh, you know, trans, queer, trans body onto the island, right? Like, and, and creating that presence and that lineage and all of this. And, and yeah, so it, it, it's, it's an, it, it's such a weird, like, it, it's such, a, it's a weird kind of grief, really. That's what it is for me. It's like, it's a kind of grief that I've never experienced before, because they, somehow there was, this belief or understanding or faith that the island is always the anchor point, right? Like whatever happens is I always have a place to go back to, right? Like there's always this island yes. that's there. Of course, I'm aware of environmentally what's happening, you know, like in, in multiple ways and like how, um, how, you know, ecologically islands are being impacted uh, in, this, in this particular moment in history. But there, there's always been that sense of reliability. And now it's a, it's a different kind of, on a very personal level, it's a very different kind of grief. And, and I've, I am, I, I, I don't have answers. I'm actually still ask, processing it and asking myself, what does it mean then for me? Yeah, in this particular moment to be writing, you know, a book that's so explicitly about like, writing the body on like you know the island body like the island body as an image comes back so many times like in that book I you know like and now and there's there's a grief like there's a spiritual grief of like seeing um yeah like the the island under attack really like in that sense right like and 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 it's a, I've been thinking a lot of the image of the Kalapani to as black water right like because when you see yeah. you see those those pictures of like just like the oil right like just the oil on like that turquoise what used to be a tur turquoise water right like and I've been thinking a lot of like the um yeah the Kalapani in that sense like the dark water 
And then the other part that I do also want to talk about, though, is that I think what the situation in Mauritius does right now is that's the thing. It's like there's a way in which with the land, we, we have clear borders, right? Like there's a way in which even colonial histories of the land, we can speak about them in, in more explicit ways, in more transparent ways. But then when it comes to water and to the ocean, because the ocean is mm. full of colonial history, right? Like, and when it comes to island histories and, and different territories, right? Like ocean territories, territories there is no border there and 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 I think that's you know in the case of the MV Wakashu for example it's it was so confusing because it was like uh, it's with the vessel is Japanese is registered in Japan but then had a flag from Panama right like um, and then it was like oh it's a Japanese vessel that's registered in Panama because then because you always have those blurry blurry lines when it comes to the maritimes right it's less controlled and they're always and and there are different ways in which you know one of the things that I I mentioned is like also like let's say the Chagos Islands which used to belong to Mauritius that the British kept when they gave Mauritius independence in 1968 and then basically sold off to the U.S. so the U.S. could have a military base in the Indian mm -hmm. Ocean and then the Chagos yeah, have been fighting for years to go back to their land because they were just the the u.s military just got there deported everyone and sent everybody to mauritius right and they never got, got to go back to their land so there's there's all those all those there's so much colonial history embedded also into and and it's still they're not just embedded they still play out nowadays in all sorts of neo-colonial forms right in terms of uh, maritimes and ocean spaces and island spaces um, and i think for me that's also the other part like there's my personal journey and my, my personal grief in terms of the oil spill but also I think for me it also brings to visibility all those murky waters all those spaces where where there's all forms of like colonial exploitation uh, happening but we don't necessarily talk about we don't even see them as we don't even see them right like because they yeah and not to be too blunt about it but there is literally no oil spill that is not colonial violence Mm -hmm. Right, like yes. it, you know, yeah. it's just like to put it like too simply. Yeah. It's just like this is obviously colonial violence. Yeah. Um. So I'm I'm aware of the time, and I really want um you to have time to uh, read from the book so that people can hear your words um, mm -hmm. given uh, life through the body. Um. And so I will disappear from the screen so that you can uh, have it all as you read. Um. And then I'll return. Um, just for a few more questions. Sure. Okay, so um, so this is Zumpam. Um, it's comprised of eight uh, lyric poems. Uh, they're actually really long poems um, that each tell different stories. You could read them separately, but together they also make up a story. Uh, the book is out and available from any bookstore um, from September 10th. So very soon it's going to be out and it's available for pre-orders from Metonymy Press if in case you want to have it earlier. Uh, so the excerpt that I'm going to be reading is, is from actually the piece Zumpam, which is one of the pieces in it. And, and it's, it's a short piece, uh, but um, one of the things that I do, what I try to do with, with this book is uh, write, imagine and write um, like trans lineages basically. Um, and so there's that part where I create uh, this uh, trans ancestor and her name is Kumkum. So I thought today I will introduce you to Kumkum. I dream of Kumkum with round shoulders, a blood red bindi on her forehead, a glint of gall hanging over the edge of her pointed nose, raven curly hair, a tad too greasy, but that still bounces up and down the nape of her neck as she walks in the morning sun. Kum Kum wears plain cotton kurtas that she huggles in the markets of Plan Verde. And if she ever gets invited to a wedding, she adorns herself of her most prized garment, a brocaded red salva kameez that wraps her rotten body like the heavy skin of syrupy litchi. Kum Kum, it's rice dal and pickles during the week, 
And on weekends, she treats herself to some dried salted fish cooked with onions, onions, fresh thyme, and tomatoes. And bon tirougaille poisson salé, bien mauricien. And bon tirougaille poisson salé, bien mauricien. Kum Kum has a radio set. And she listens to the news and Avi de Desi every morning and Hindi songs every evening. Kum Kum rubs coconut oil in her jet black hair every Sunday. Kum Kum has a job. She works in the tobacco factory in the capital city with all the poor women whose husbands had died in obscure wars nobody on the island really knows about. They fought in a far away British war, but then they never came back. On her lunch break, Kum Kum does not step out with the other women to roll tobacco in small newspaper pieces that burn their darkened lips. Instead, she stays at her workstation. She sits silently and she prays, she prays, she prays to Goddess Durgama. She prays for safety. She prays for a long life. She prays for forgiveness. She prays for love. When it gets hot in the capital city, Kum Kum takes out a white embroidered handkerchief and wipe from her purse and wipes the purse of sweat from her forehead. Kum Kum likes flower patterns. Kum Kum loves embroidery. On Sundays, Kum Kum polishes her floor a embosses coco. She brings out her mattress, leans it in the sun against the mango tree, beats it with a stick. She winnows her rice and lentils for the week. She makes fruit pickles that she dries on her roof. And at the end of the day, she massages her feet with a slick of warm coconut oil. Kum Kum has a lover. But does Kum Kum have a lover? I'm not sure yet where, whether Kum Kum has a lover, but this is Kum Kum, this is Kum Kum, and I dream about her every day. She draws her life like a moving sculpture, ephemeral, becoming and unbecoming herself with every single one of my dreams. So yeah, so this was an excerpt from uh, Zumpam. Uh, the yeah, book's going to be out September 10th. Order it from any of your bookstores, or you can also pre order it from Metonymy Press. Kama, thank you so much. I love spending time with you. I love learning from you. I, um, hearing your, you know, having read the book and then hearing you read it, um, there's such profoundly different experiences, and, and I love each of them. And I think that, uh, I hope that everyone who enjoyed hearing you read so beautifully from the book. We'll also experience it um, as a physical object in the hands um, and explore certainly the, the ways that you arrange words on the page and, uh, and, and really um, just like thrive in these hinterlands and borderlands between, uh, between you know, the, the published word and, and the book as art form um, and the book as performance, and the book as incantation. Um, thank you. I, I, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh my God, thank you for having me. And also, uh, can I say, you were also one of the first people to read the book because you read an advanced reading copy. And I'm so touched and so moved that it spoke to you in those ways. So thank you for, for engaging with the work. And thank you for inviting me for this chat today. So I look forward to... Um, to uh when we can see each other in the flesh um but in until then um we're getting many thanks from the q a box so thank you all for joining us and spending this time with us um i hope it's been as revelatory and and luminous as it has been for me be well comma and be well everyone who's joined us thank you thank you